Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining me this Sunday, September the 27th, the last Sunday uh, in the month of September as we look at Psalm chapter 19. So I'm hoping you are already got your Bible in front of you. Go ahead and be opening that to Psalm chapter 19. We'll be getting to that in just one moment. Had a wonderful crowd here this morning. A little lower than it was last week, uh, but we still had 101 in attendance. I have no idea. I haven't looked to see how many was uh, watching online, but uh, uh, we pray that uh, that either you were watching online or you were uh, here worshiping with us, or if you're you're not a member at Shiloh that you worshipped with your your home congregation. And uh, it is such a, a pleasure pleasure to be able to worship our Creator. And I hope we don't ever take that for granted. And I hope that we always take advantage of it when we can, that we can get to worship. Not have to worship, but get to worship our Creator on the first day of the week as He commands us to do. So we'll go ahead and, and begin as we, we looked at. Uh, we want you to look at, if you didn't, uh, wasn't part of our worship service this morning, uh, we ask you to go back and watch that here on our YouTube channel or our Facebook channel and uh, check that out. Uh, we, we prayed for several uh, this morning. We we're grateful that Sister Joe Holden had successful surgery, that she is at home uh, recovering. Uh, we do pray that that recovery will go well and that she'll be at as minimal pain as possible. Uh, but we also pray uh, for Brother Leon Hines and Sister Pat Ballantyne as they both have major surgeries tomorrow. Brother Leon's is at uh, North Alabama Medical Center in Florence. Sister Pat's is down at UAB in Birmingham, and we are praying for them. Uh, Sister Pat will probably have to spend a few days, possibly uh, close to the whole week, uh, down there at UAB. Uh, Brother Leon possibly get to come home Tuesday evening uh, or Wednesday morning. So uh, pray fervently for those two uh, this evening and tomorrow uh, on the 28th as they both have surgery. Uh, tomorrow. Pray for the doctors and nurses that are tending to them and just pray. So let's begin. We're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 19. This is a, a, a praise to God involving the works of God and the word of God. So if you're like me, I love alliteration. Uh, and so this is the works and the word of God. He's going to begin in the first six verses. And he's going to talk about uh, the natural revelation of God. In other words, the creation as it is seen through us. That's nature. Then he's going to talk about the supernatural. God's revealed word. How he revealed it uh, to the prophets and to those New Testament writers. Verses 7 through 14. So verses 1 through 6, creation. Verses 7 through 14, revelation. So natural or supernatural revelation. And so we'll begin and look at the first six verses here uh, as we look at creation. Then the last uh, eight verses, 7 through 14, uh, talking about revelation. So let's begin this afternoon. Psalm chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. David says, or writes rather, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. That word firmament uh, meaning the, the, the sky, the sky, the space. Uh, you know, you think about the, the four heavens mentioned in the Bible. Many people say there's only three or four. Uh, you can go either way. Uh, but if you, if you subscribe to the four heavens mentioned in the Bible, you think about where the birds are. That is one heaven. In other words, the sky. Then you have space. Uh, the space, the outer space, the stars, the moon, the sun, that is uh, considered a heaven uh, in, in the Bible. Then you have paradise. Uh, a lot of people leave paradise out as one of the heavens. They clump it in with the heaven where God dwells. And so as the fourth heaven. So you, you have the sky where the birds are. You have space. You have paradise. And then you have where God dwells, heaven. And so that's the four heavens mentioned in the Bible. Here he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, many people believing there, the sky, uh, the, 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 what you can see, then the, the firmament, the firmament shows his 
handiwork, the space, the stars, the sun, the moon, uh, that shows his handiwork. You, you think about how how the earth is formed, how the earth was formed, but especially how the where the earth is within our atmosphere. Uh, you know, people have said one mile closer to the sun, oh, it would be so hot on earth that we couldn't live here. One mile cl- back farther from the sun, it would be so cold that we wouldn't survive. God put us in the perfect spot. You can't say that, oh, by chance, oh, yay, two rocks hit together, and by chance, here we are. We're, we're in the perfect spot in the universe where we don't get too cold, we don't get too hot, and life is good. Hogwash. Hogwash. That's, that, to me, that just, that is, I hate to sound condescending, but that is the dumbest answer that you can have. Uh, that that oh by chance we're in the perfect spot in the universe where where you know we're not hitting anything we're not hitting the moon's not hitting us and we're not hitting the moon and and it's just by chance all that happened gravity all that yay it happened hogwash that's that's just ridiculous absolutely ridiculous to think that you think about it the heavens declare the glory of God the firmament shows his handiwork I, I think about Romans chapter 1 and verse 19 and 20 where he says because what may be known of God is manifest or made known in them for God has shown it to them how for since the creation of the world his invisible at- attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I don't have an excuse. God is made known to me through the creation of the world, through nature. I can look at it and say, hey, wow, God had to do this. There had to be a supreme being that did this. And that supreme being is the God, the only God, God of heaven. And he is the one that did this. You can go back to Genesis chapter 1 and read uh, the the creation account. And it happened just like it says. Six 24-hour literal days. Look at verse 2. He says, verses 2 through 6. And we'll, we'll look at all of these and talk about them. But he says, day unto day utters speech. And night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voices is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set the tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of its chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. It is rising from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Here he's saying, you know, in other words, he's asking, where can you go for creation, for, for the creation not to exist? You can't. You, there's no way you can go anywhere else and, and believe that we are like we are except the creation account. That's all there is. Uh, any other any other theory, idea, just doesn't make sense. It, it, it really doesn't. You know, God is the, the lawgiver to nature. He's the one that set nature into place. We can't control it. Uh, you know, we can't control the weather. But God can. Why? Because he created it. His creation leaves evidence and it leaves evidence for us so that we can praise him because of the evidence he leaves in the creation we ought to praise god day in and day out we need to continually praise him look at this here in verse six Something interesting, you know. This morning, if you if you you were, were present for services or you watched it online, uh, I, I talked a little bit about how uh, you know studying the Bible grounds us in the faith, and, and I talked about Isaiah forty and verse twenty two, where it says, uh, "It is He who sits on the circle of the earth." You know, Isaiah didn't have 
satellites back in, in 714 BC to know that the earth was circular. Um, we do now, but by faith we should have known it before without the satellites. But here's another one that goes very close to Isaiah 40 and verse 22. He's talking about the, the, the sun here. Uh, you know, he go, go back up to verse 4 when he says, In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. And he continues to talk about the sun. And look at what he says. And it's circuit to one other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Right here, it's already talking about the circuit of the sun. In other words, the planets that revolve around the sun. They, they revolve, and, and, and they're, they're in his circuit because they're going around the sun continually. You know, they, they, the, the, the planets just can't wander off. You know, hey, I can let our dog out every now and then, or Stephanie's dog. I'll blame it on her. Uh, but Stephanie's dog, she's a little Yorkie. Uh, her name is Bella. We can let her out every now and then. And if we don't pay attention to her, she's going to run off. The planets don't do that. The planets don't run off. They don't wander off. They don't go somewhere else. They're in this circuit. How did David know that the planets were in a circuit around the sun? Had to have known. He would have had to have known this from God. These planets hold to the pattern. And it wasn't discovered by scientists. This pattern of, of, of how the planets circu circulate the sun, it wasn't really discovered by scientists until the, the, the 1600s. I think in 1500, late 1500s, one guy had, had mentioned it, and he was, you know, people thought, well, this guy's just a complete blooming idiot, if you will. And, uh, you know, we're going to discredit him. But then in the 1600s, a man named Galileo, you might have heard of him, um, he come up with this idea that, hey, the planets circuit around the sun they're they're in this planetary motion and and, and they they revolve around the sun and, and many many philosophers before then thought everything revolved around the earth but you know who knew that it was the other way around david here in psalm chapter 19 and verse 6 he knew it through inspiration of god what a wonderful wonderful passage how much can we know just by studying God's Word. Now let's move on from creation to revelation. How God revealed His Word. Look at verse 7. He says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The law of the Lord Think about it. Law giving is an extension of God's mercy. Remember who God is. God is holy. God is wrathful. You know, because of God's holiness, sin cannot enter in Him, cannot be around Him. Because of God's wrathfulness, He destroys sin, uh, you know, as far as eternity. He will not allow it to be with him for eternity, even be around him. But because he loves us and he is merciful for us, not giving us, uh, rendering to us what is due, you know, the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. The wages of sin is death, or Romans chapter 6, verse 23, rather. Wages of sin is death. But. But that's what we deserve, but that's not what God gives us. It's His mercy, not rendering, withholding justice due. He gives us His law. Have you ever looked at it that way? Wow. It's, this is not a bunch of uh, a do's and don'ts. This is God's mercy for me. This is God giving this to me so that I won't have to die the second death. This is how much God loves me. And I think when we truly start thinking about the Bible that way, when we really start thinking about the Bible as, as not a, a handbook of, of oh, burden, do's and don'ts, and we start thinking about it as this is, this is God showing me He loves me, not only through the death of Christ, who, who reconciles us through His blood to God, through obedience, but He tells us how to be obedient. 
You know, the death of Christ is the concrete foundation for Christianity. But it would mean nothing to us if we did not have the God of the Bible, the God from the Bible, rather, to show us what it meant for us and what it does for us and how we can please God. It would mean nothing. No, it would have been in vain because we would not have known what to do to come in contact with that blood, how to come in contact with that blood to save us. We would not know what we need to do after we come in contact with that blood that saves us to continue uh, walking down the Christian walk of life. The law of God, the extension of his mercy. He says it's perfect. It does what it was designed to do. It is perfect. What does it do? Converting the soul. Some versions may re use the word restoring the soul. But I like the way the New King James Version uses that converting the soul. The only way, as we talked about this morning, the only way we can truly be converted is through the Word of God. It telling us what God did for us in the sending of Christ and what we need to do to obey Him. The testimony of the Lord is sure. In other words, it's infallible. I can't find a problem with God's Word. If I find one contradiction with God's Word, I need to throw it out. But it's not. Many people have claimed that there's contradictions, but they don't really study the Bible to see that they're not. It's harmonized. It's infallible. It is not wrong. Making the wise, or making wise rather, the simple. This, this, this Bible is not a burden to us. It makes us smart in God's eyes. Oh, oh people have said, well, you're just one of them Bible thumpers. You're not smart. What does our world say? Scientists are smart. Those who believe in evolution, they're smart. You know, uh, what was the guy's name in, in the wheelchair? Uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, you know, he had ALS. He, he passed away, and I hate that because he passed away uh, from, from all accounts uh, from himself outside of God because he didn't believe in God. And the world said, oh, he was one of the smartest men ever to live. According to the Bible, he wouldn't. Those who, who believe the Bible, who are converted, who, who, who listen to it, who listen to the testimony of God, then they're the ones who are wise. You know, we looked at this verse this morning, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Verse 8, the statues of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Look at the effect of God's word. It rejoices, it makes our hearts rejoice, and it makes our eyes enlightened. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. God will always be revealed and always be revealed. He will always be, needs to be reverend. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteousness altogether. God will always and has always made the correct decisions. His judgments are true and righteous altogether. Verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter than a honeycomb, or sweeter than honey, rather, and the honeycomb. God's word is the most valuable thing on earth. More valuable than gold. It's more sweeter than, than the honey and the honeycomb. Verse 11, moreover, by them your servant is warned. And in keeping them, there is a great reward. How do I know that I'm pleasing God? How do I know it's through the Word of God, he says. It tells me what God likes, and it tells me what God dislikes. 
I'm warned. And when I keep it, I have that great reward. Look at verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Verse 13. But think about it. Look at what, Go back to what he says here. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. What, I can't do that on my own. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23. O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in itself. It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. I can't do that. I, I, it's not me. I, I'm not the one who decides what is sin and what is not sin. That's God. The only way to keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins is through the Word of God. It's through the Word. Look at the last part of verse 13. Let him not have let let them rather. Let don't let them sins. Don't let the sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless. And I shall be as innocent. I shall be innocent of, of great transgressions. As long as I don't go against God's law, David says here, I'm going to be rewarded. As long as I don't miss the mark, sin, have trans, I, as long as I don't transgress God's law, I don't go above God's law, I don't go below God's law, I try my dead level best to keep God's law. Remember, sin is transgression of the law, John says in 1 John. And then he finishes out this great psalm right here. By saying, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. My strength and my Redeemer. May my outward life and may my inward life please you, God. That's what David finishes the psalm by saying. May the outside, my mouth, the outward part of me and the meditation, my mind, the inward part, be pleasing to you all the time. Folks, that needs to be our goal. Our goal each and every day to please God. Remember what we said about Enoch. Hebrews chapter 11. He pleased God. What a, what a wonderful way to be remembered as one who pleased God. Hope you have a great week. Thank you so much for joining me this week for Psalm chapter 19. And, and, and I pray that this week you'll reflect on this psalm, reflect on the goodness of God's creation and God's revelation in the Word of God to us. And Lord willing, next week, the first Sunday in October, we'll be looking at Psalm chapter 29 verses of that great psalm. If you can be here next week for services 10 a.m., uh, here at Shiloh Church Christ, we'll be looking looking at next week, Lord willing, the bride of Christ. Why the church is important to God because or to Christ because it's his bride. Hope you have a great week again. Remember those in prayer. Pray fervently tomorrow for Brother Leon and Sister Pat. And Lord willing, we'll see you next time. Again, thank you. And to God be the glory.